All right. So here we are again, back at Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. I'm Eric Wall, and I'm the director of the Berkshire Cultural Resource Center that is getting a chance to host this awesome conversation again. We had so much fun last week. And you know what's so great is that we don't just have to end the conversation, we can keep the party going. So last week we talked about with the wonderful Alexandra Terry and Genevieve Gagnard. And Alexandra Terry is the associate curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Santa Barbara, where Genevieve opened her show right before we all went into co and went into quarantine. Um, outside looking in. And so last week we got to talk about kind of the organic process that brings a curator and an artist together and how the relationship builds. And we got to hear all the uh, stories about the actual coming together and ideas behind it. And then this week we get to talk about the actual mechanics and the logistics. So I've got my notepad. <laughs> Uh, but again, I want to welcome everybody to uh, the second part of our discussion. And um, as we always do, we invite people to share through chat any comments that you have. But definitely, if you want to ask questions, Veronica will keep an eye out for those that either raise their hands like this or digitally let us know. And we want to give you an opportunity to either ask um, Alexandra or Genevieve the question yourself or um, Myself or Veronica will relay it to them. But um, let's just get started. I'm going to hand it off to Alex and Genevieve. Hello. Thank you, Erica. And I want to first of all thank Erica and Veronica for inviting me to talk to Genevieve and for organizing this series of talks, which has been really um, a wonderful community, you know, way of forming community throughout this time. And I'm just glad that we have the opportunity to highlight Genevieve's exhibition, which was only open for a week, as, as Erica said. So thank you to both of you for all of the work that you've put into this. Our pleasure. So Genevieve. So. <laughs> okay, everybody, I'm gonna start my slide. I'm gonna share my screen, hang on. Um, so what we thought we would do today is walk through the exhibition um, and talk about the works in the exhibition and, and talk about kind of the context of this particular show. We, we talked a lot last week about what it means to bring pre-existing works together and what the selection process might be. And obviously when you bring works that have been made separate from one another, but over a certain period of time together, you have you create kind of new context, new discourse. Um, as I think you can all see, I am in the installation. Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna talk about these works. Hopefully it's not too, there isn't too much of an echo because it's kind of the sound in here is the acoustics are a little different. Um, but yeah, so to begin with, whoops. This is the front of the museum. This is what you see when you first walk up and you come in and you see this little sign that says, I'm really sorry, but we're closed right now. <laughs> but the cool thing is that um, there's a lot of foot traffic that passes the front of the museum. And so I'm, I've been really happy that this work of Genevieve's remains up for people to see and is intriguing and hopefully draws people to our website so that they can see images of the ex exhibition, but also you'll see through the glass a big pink room in the middle of the gallery. So uh, we just, Genevieve wanted, asked me to put the, throw this image up here so that we get this vision of walking through the exhibition so we can kind of give you that sort of virtual tour feeling. I also just love that giant banner, so. Yeah. We, I want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. What are you when when we take it down? It's all yours. Where are you going to put it? <laughs> You're going to have to start planning. Is you might remember her. She came here. She was an artist. 
she came here, she was sort of heavy set, and it was the time that we had the transsexual guy who came. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So, can everybody hear me? Yes, someone might want to mute themselves. I hear a couple other voices in there. Okay, so this is the front of the museum. We're gonna kind of, when we created the map, uh, we talked last week about didactics and the choice that we made to create a map rather than have um, wall labels and to kind of give a feeling of the flow through the space. So you can actually access the map. I know it's kind of maybe doesn't have as much meaning if you're not in the space, but you can access the map on our, on, on the exhibitions page on our website. And we sort of purposefully numbered the works to give a feeling of how to move throughout the space. Um, in some sense that was, I guess, organic, but I have to say that we, Genevieve, when you came to visit the museum, I, I feel like you. Yeah, I knew where were, things were kind of could go. You knew where things were going to go and you were really clear about this room. Correct? Yeah. yeah. So this piece is called Seeing is Believing. And you see this, uh, it's wallpapered. Um, I'll, I'll refer back. I know some of you weren't in the call last week, but I kind of like to refer back to some of the technical elements that we talked about now that you're seeing them. So one of the choices that was made on the spot during install was originally this wallpaper was going to be about eight feet high. But while I was on FaceTime with Genevieve, with the wallpaper, the amazing wallpaper team, Genevieve said, you know, immediately knew that it needed to come up a foot and it really makes a huge difference because when you're, you know, so now it's nine feet, which is much more enveloping. And um, it just kind of, it's more overwhelming, I feel, when you move into that space. Like the faces are kind of looming at you a bit more. Ex exactly. They, they take up so much more space. So the, fee the, the conversation I remember us having about this piece immediately going in here is starting the exhibition by creating a sense of otherness. And that's really what happens in, in, in the interaction with this work. So you see the wallpaper is these Gibson girl faces. And you know, Gibson girls were this kind of ideal standard of physical attractiveness for women in the late 19th and early 20th century. And you see they're white, they have a very specific look on their face, they have like these, you know, Cupid's bow, Cupid lips and bouffant, and like it's a very specific ideal of beauty. And you're faced with this mirror that is black. And so when you, when you look into the mirror, the reflection of yourself is a black reflection. And it immediately creates this sense of uh, people, first of all, staring out at you. It feels very kind of, for me, I will speak for me and my experience, you know, because everybody has their own experience, but um, kind of like judging you know, you're being judged by these faces and just, and, and there's this immediate sense of comparing, comparing oneself to them. So maybe Genevieve, I, I find that story about your creating this work really interesting. Maybe you'd be willing to share that with us. Yeah. So I made this work for the show at Flag Arts Foundation originally. And I think it's also been at the show at UT Austin and this is its third iteration and it's cool because this is like the first time that I feel like it really it's like you're walking down this kind of tunnel almost of these faces um, but the concept for this piece really stemmed from a conversation I was having with a friend fellow artist who oddly enough, had taken a trip to North Adams. And she kind of came back speaking about her experiences. And, you know, she's a black woman. And she said she was walking down the street and she would like hear people locking their doors on their car. And so 
I instantly like, you know, obviously just like listening to her experience and just feeling super disgusted, but also sad, just like this, that this is how people act. Um, obviously there's a lot worse things people do and can do, but, um, I wanted to kind of create a space that spoke to that kind of experience of feeling like you're being looked at by what, you know, America has kind of set up as normal and what, um, and that's whiteness, I guess. And so this concept for the black mirror kind of being like more metaphorical or conceptual idea for um, the viewer to be reflected and seeing themselves as black in a black mirror. But I don't know if it really does that, but that's, that was my thoughts behind it. Well, I think one thing I love about this exhibition is that there are many opportunities to sort of lose yourself in your surroundings and to kind of come out of your everyday experience. And I love that we started the exhibition. I love that you, you immediately knew. So basically for those who haven't been to the museum, when you walk in immediately to your left is this gallery, which is a smaller space, but it's, it has a depth to it. So that when you walk in and the wallpaper is completely surrounding you, it's, it's a very kind of immersive experience and like you said, it, it, you know, it's a conceptual, the, the reflection of the black figure back at you is a, a conceptual um, act, but the combination of these faces and this, the way the space works and the wallpaper really, I think, begins that sense of, of okay, this is, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not gonna maybe experience, like, my expectations of what I'm going to experience here might have to change and, and be open, you know, really be open to what, to experiencing someone else's maybe every day or different experience. Um, I also wanted to say that, um, you know, your use of, we'll see this more. And as I said, like the, the sense of the immersive um, experience as you walk through the exhibition. Um, there are so many emotions that come out throughout as you move through the space. And again, speaking for myself, you know, it's a real mixture of um, humor. I mean, there's so much humor in the work, but also, but also as we're experiencing in this piece right here, kind of, you know, that horrible experience that your, your friend um, had to go through the sense of otherness being outside of, and the title of the exhibition is Outside Looking In. And I would love to hear more from you about the, where that comes from. But again, every sort of vignette and every installation creates another sense of providing an outside looking in view. Yeah, I think that started to become very apparent and it's funny, um, like Aaron can attest to this. A lot of times I'll be like, okay, working title, outside looking in. And then it's like, oh no, that just, that was the thing. Do you know, it was like that first idea that might not have been like, it didn't seem like it was, it had the pizzazz that it maybe needed, but often it just kind of rolls off the tongue and it's, oh, okay, that's what it needs to be. And we yeah. don't have to revisit that. And so... I guess I wasn't even really thinking about that when we were looking at that other piece, but it does do exactly that, which is really nice yeah. to think about. I mean, I think every, every, every section, I keep, I keep saying vignette in my mind, but every part of the show, the installations, I think provides that feeling, you know, otherness and looking into someone else's experience or looking out from yourself and, and, and witnessing like, you know, otherness. Um, so this is, as you move through the space here, is the wall, the pink wall that we talked about, well, the pink house and the pink wall that we talked about last week, you know, the, the feeling of those kind of last minute touches and the sense that they add, you know, this wall that has the intro panel originally was meant to be white, but then there was just a feeling of mirroring other parts of the exhibition, other color, color palettes. Well, wasn't um, in there like almost like a sea foamy or like... Yeah, originally, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
but you were like, it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to work. <laughs> um, so here's, here's the house. And we, uh, again, we talked about this last week that encompasses the two installations, black is beautiful and be more. Um, and what I love is I'm going to go back really quick to the outside. We wanted to really play on, you know, notions of what a house looks like, obviously, and imagining the kind of picket fence and front lawn. But I wanted there to be a sight line of the window of the house from the front of the front door so that you can, you know, you again, playing on that outside looking in. You're looking into the museum, but again, you're going to be on the outside of the house. And, um, and it's like a clue for the viewers to know that there's something in there that they have to explore and go into to check out. And it provides so many different perspectives. So you'll see, so this is, this is that window right here behind me. <laughs> um, and here's another view. So just like um, a kind of broader view of the entire installation. But I really want to dive in and start talking about these two installations. So in this image on the left is Be More and on the right Black is Beautiful. And these two works were not created together or necessarily to be exhibited together, but you were pretty clear early on that these two were going to be. Yeah, I figured they would work. Yeah. yeah. And what I love is that line down the middle. It ha it, it really gives that kind of Wes Anderson landscape. Um, there's another image of it later on. But so the piece on the right, um, Black is Beautiful from 2016, has been shown quite a few times. And I think it's actually, it's being shown again in the early in the new year. Is that right? Um, that's the plan. I don't know if it's all gone through yet, but... <laughs> So I hear back from them in two two months, two years. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, so again, as I said, creating the sense of kind of outsider. I mean, I have heard feedback from people being in the space. You know, obviously we were only open for a week, so we haven't had as many visitors as, as we would have wanted at this point. But you know, I've had people express to me this sense of sort of trespassing when they're in this space. You know, a sense of walking into, um, also walking into kind of a sanctuary because the way that places pieces are placed, I, there, this is for me another repeating kind of theme is the sense of the altar. I think in your work, there are so many vignettes and you set up these real kind of altars where um, it can be both an homage to something that's important to you, or it can sort of be an altar that questions something really insidious and really dark, but using all of your tools, um, you know, your conceptual tools and humor and, and questioning. Um, but I, I love that the experience people have in this room really runs the gamut of feeling like they're coming home mm -hmm. on the one hand for some people, and then also feeling like they're trespassing. Right. And it's, yeah, it's always kind of that, or like just an overall sense of nostalgia. Like if, I don't know, I, I'm trying to think about things I heard people saying at the opening and just being like, oh, I had that, or we had this wallpaper, you know, things like that. And I, and I like hearing such an array of people having those experience and, you know, there's this constant like goal to divide us but we have all these like common threads. So I feel like those, the installations kind of point that out too. Completely. And one thing that I, I think I mentioned to you and it has maybe a bit more, it's more in relation to be more, which we'll talk about next. But in that week, so many people came in because they had seen images of these pieces online and they wanted to photograph themselves in the space. And there were different kind of threads that came out of that. But one thing that I noticed is because it was so exciting and so inviting and so lush and there's so many colors and every surface is covered in things that you wanna look at and really spend time with, um, 
but there are also these real um, serious moments of questioning and questioning um, you know, the history of blackness in America and what it means to be at the intersection of um, different cultures coming together. And people are photographing them in a space, themselves in a space, not realizing how charged some of the imagery is and some of the objects in the room are. And they don't need, you know, they don't necessarily need to know that to have their own experience in the space. But what I love is that it kind of leaves so much space for further discussion the more you realize what, what you're surrounded by. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm thinking a lot about the conversation we had a couple weeks back with Taryn and that like her saying that she was looking at the space and like there were so many details it's like it's almost like you could come into the show leave and then come back and see something totally different or just go to a different part of the show come back and revisit it and maybe gain some more knowledge from some of the other works and then come back and um and I don't really know if I'm aware of all of that part of those parts of how I create these things but um it's it's just interesting to watch folks interact with it and I think what's so what allows also for that revisiting because I feel the same I mean I'm in the space way more than anybody at, well I'm the only Sarah and I are the only ones in the space right now but I see something new every time, but also I see something new that I can relate to every time, which pulls me in and then it leads way to something that I might not be able to relate to and it allows me to further question like the juxtaposition of those objects and what they mean. Um, and I think a really important part of this installation is that you wanted to create a space where young or i mean you know age is, is not an is not an issue here but black and brown women can come in and see themselves in the space mm -hmm. so part of that is is through this amazing collection of cabbage patch dolls which are like you know a variety of cabbage patch dolls a couple of which are yours and your friends from childhood yeah it was this idea to kind of create a spectrum as of blackness as much as you could with a cabbage patch doll which I don't know if it reads like that, but yeah. um, I also just like this idea of like, that's the audience or they're looking at you looking at that, you know, it, again, it feels like that, you know, outside looking in kind of st just keeps like showing up in different oh, ways. Exactly. It's like cyclical and meta. And there are so like, the more you think about <laughs> it in a space, the more it happens, the more it comes up. Um, I'm not sure. Oh yeah, I think in one of the images I, I have the poster. Um, but like this telephone, I think this little telephone toy, that is one of those things that everybody's like, I had one of those. And if they didn't have one, they're like, I wanted one of those so bad. <laughs> and for me, The Wiz, like the record, the album of The Wiz, when I opened that, I mean, you know, going, referring back to our conversation last week and that sort of behind the scenes feeling, I feel so lucky to have been there when things were being unwrapped because I had my own reaction to everything. And mm -hmm. even though I had seen installation images of the work, seeing them come together in the way that you create relationships between the objects adds so much more to these objects, to these things that maybe like the MC Hammer doll, which I said that I had and also the MC Hammer doll here. And like, I, I put him in this kind of specific arm position, this kind of don't shoot kind of hands up. And like, that's a subtle move, but that's what I was thinking about. And it was like that when I first did it at cam and I make sure it's positioned like that every time. So sometimes there's little subtle teeth, like subtle things that most folks might just kind of skim over, but there are little moments like that where I'm just like, nope, I'm going to try and put my message in here like every bit of the way. And also I was thinking about kind of going back to your childhood home, but as, as you age, like different things would be introduced 
you know, like, so some of the toys look like for a real young person. And then there's like board games and magazines and an exercise bike and that, you know, hopefully young kids don't have to deal with all that stuff. Right. <laughs> I mean, and that's another thing that a, yet another theme that runs throughout the exhibition that sense of, that came up when we were talking about the Gibson girls, that sense of ideal beauty. And, you know, the next installation we talk about, Be More, is, is really references that a lot. But, you know, here you have an exercise bike and underneath it, you have, I think, a screenplay or it's like um, a script for a play called Fat Pig. Is that right? Or a, a, a little novella or something. But there are these moments to that question societal ideals of beauty for women throughout. And, you know, for me, it, it, it's one of the many elements of your work that, that really, I, I can really relate to and I really think about and, and what I feel is important to be talk, discussing in this, um, on this platform. It's like, who says, you know, up above here is that picture of Kim Kardashian. See uh -huh. if you can see it. Um, here, I think. It's and nice. it's, <laughs> that's her butt, you can see. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's that, who, who <laughs> image? Was it Jurgen Tell? Was it a Jurgen Teller image of Kim, I think? Or, I don't know. She's naked and all oiled up. And it's you- That famous, like, cover she did, I don't know. Yeah. But you see her behind. And I, it was really interesting for me to hear you talk about the Kardashians in the context of them appropriating body types that haven't for decades been seen as beautiful and turn and monetizing it and turning it and appropriating it, turning it into something that is aspirational. Yeah. So she's kind of juxtaposed with this image of um, the Mammy from Gone with the Wind. And so I don't, that was, that was a piece, like a piece that I just made on its own a long time ago. And she's got, it's, there's no way you can tell what you're looking at in this picture, but I, there was one of those toothpicks with an American flag that you would maybe put in like a finger sandwich or something. And so that's kind of jutting off of, um, out of the hands of, um, the one image. And then Kim Kardashian's image was like they blacked out because I guess she was topless for this image they blacked out her chest and I just wrote the words homesick over her chest I don't even know what that means I was homesick when I made it I just like <laughs> someone can unpack that someday. <laughs> um so yeah so here's that Again, so I know, again, I want to talk about the, the happy I love accident. how this is shot. It's so cool. It's so good. And look, it's... Oh, yeah. There it is. Behind me. Double vision. <laughs> um, but just the play, the color, play on color and texture, and you want to touch everything, and you want to, you know, that, that flamingo wallpaper is textured, and the floral wallpaper is vintage, and just the thoughtfulness that has gone into what you've put together here, that funny cat, ceramic cat climbing the wall. Um, Doesn't everyone have that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a thing in your bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanna talk about Be More and that mirror has been the site of many a selfie. Really? Yes. But that's what I mean. There were many selfies taken in the one week that we had in that mirror and just love that there were levels of context that maybe weren't being engaged with. Doesn't matter. The person still had their own relationship with the space, but I just, I love that you provide all of these different levels of engagement and pathways for people to enter the works. So if you can't really tell what's going on here, the work is called Be More the mirror that you're, you would stand in front of at the sink um, has the words be more written in lipstick on it. So there's this kind of double like meaning. So it's like kind of could be read as like encouraging or it could be read as you're not enough, <laughs> you know? So I liked that kind of 
I think a lot of people, no matter your sex, like you just kind of always, there's always that pressure of not being enough or not fitting the standard of what people are like, what we're told to like reach, which, which is normal and what is normal and all of that stuff. So. Um, exactly. Yeah. But also I think, and that resonates throughout the work. So you can see here, these are different beauty products for black women, predominantly for black women. There's, you know, hair uh, products, body products, that speaks to that as well. So there's that sense of aspiration to, of beautifying ourselves, as well as a sense of self-care in a way. And that's what I feel in this piece. There's, it, it's the self-care kind of balanced with that feeling of you're not enough, you need to be more. There's, there's hair straightening products, there's skin lightening products. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, skin lightening products and companies that are producing skin lightening products are really having a spotlight shine on them at the moment because I think so many people don't realize how prevalent they are, how damaging they are, how available they are, um, and how many cultures, um, you know, start using our, you know, young women are introduced to skin lightening products at a, at an early age. And, and so there's like, it's a real balance here. And, and, you know, behind me, you see these towels, which are hundred dollar bill towels which kind of have a cheeky you know funny like kitschy feeling to them but it again it's like confronting that idea of consumerism capital and you know the and profiting off of these things exactly they you know profiting off of women's insecurities or just setting it up like even to reference the skin lightening creams again it's like again it's like we're constantly put in this feeling of reaching the ultimate and that is whiteness and so that that's just really damaging um i don't know propaganda that gets fed to us like very early so let me see i think i'm gonna zoom in um these are two separate images but I loved, again, these vignettes. And so within the entire installation, there are these little areas that we can focus on that provide so much. And I love this, which is just to the right of um, the mirror, but it's the Ebony Fashion Fair, what's mm -hmm. going on. And, you know, I think of this in the same way as the poster behind me of, you know, a visual representation of black women empowerment. You know, the stance, the way both of these women are standing, um, the space that they're given in the image. So it's all of these, this balancing, the questioning and also the allowing people to see themselves as empowered humans. And also the, every magazine in that, there's a bunch of stacks of magazines throughout and each, um, has a black woman on the cover. And I remember when I first created this show, um, how awesome that was to go into a magazine shop. And I was like, whoa, there's so many people of color on these magazines. And so I wanted to really display that for this piece, you know? So again, it's like, it's kind of pushing and pulling at itself, you know, but, um, I think that's again why I often say that the question the the work is asking questions it's it's just kind of setting up to have bigger conversations. One thing I really like that is super subtle is that you put feminine feminine hygiene products on top of the toilet and there's like a bag you know the kind of bag like a uh, like to be discreet, you know, put your feminine care products in here to put them in the trash can. Yeah. And um, we never talked about that, but I, I feel like it's such a subtle and yet powerful um, placement and message. It just reminded me of something like my mom's like, well, we used to have to put them in these bags and 
you have, used to have to like strap the pad to your underwear. Uh, it's like a little too much maybe for this. <laughs> but so it's like I have information of it. So of like how it used to be and kind of like it's like comparing that large bag that you had to dispose a giant pad in then next to that like little bag of like panty liners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, I love that. And um, the evolution of <laughs> the evolution of <laughs> hygiene. Um, Genevieve, would you be willing to talk about your collecting? I know that this is something that comes up a lot, but and I got to hear some cool anecdotes about where you find these objects and how you come across them. Sometimes you're with Aaron, sometimes you find it on, you know, Craigslist, but I, I just think that's super interesting. Yeah, so again, this was originally uh, for a show in New York. I had some things in a storage unit in Massachusetts from the show I did at spring break. So that toilet and sink got repurposed. Those were once at the spring break show. Mm -hmm. And then even the mirror was this kind of cool 70s mirror that was supposed to have like lights and everything hooked up but um it's implied when you see it in person and i remember just kind of going to this one spot in a nearby town and rummaging through this kind of barn situation there was a lot of bat poop in there <laughs> remember <laughs> me, yeah i just remember being like this is it's like I want that mirror, but it's really gross. So we had to clean that up, but it worked. That mirror was covered in bat poop. I don't know if it was covered, but I couldn't see myself in it. You're like I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Aaron was Aaron involved in this? No, Aaron. Aaron didn't see that until it got to the space. Okay. Um, but Aaron was involved in going to, you know, the shop to get all the products. And the guy thought I was crazy because I was getting just like large clusters of certain things. Um, and then this particular shop had this window and a bunch of things were like faded in the window. And I loved that. So I was like, can I get the faded one in the, like in the, like he had to climb over boxes of stuff to get to the window. And he was just like, why do you want this? And I was like, it's cool. It's for a show. I don't know. If that makes sense. Don't worry about it, man. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was a fun adventure. But I remember we got there when they said they were going to open, and then we were like waiting for the guy, and like he didn't have the key, and he was waiting for the person with the key, and we were just like, yeah, there's always an adventure. Yeah, but I and there is that sense of authenticity in these works. It's like some of the packaging is faded and some of it is a little used and some of it is open. And, you know, um, there is like a thing of Vaseline on the, you know, some like these, these pomades and the lipstick that are open. It's again, like you really feel that sense of trespassing and that's because of that. Cause it looks like you're walking in someone's bathroom that they just, you know, they stepped out for a minute. I love seeing the viewer that like goes so far to like pump a little bit of the lotion in their hand and they're just like <laughs> looking at things and they're just like <laughs> massaging their hands. <laughs> and I'm like, they, it, it's just like, I mean, obviously I don't want everyone doing that, but it's, it's kind of a sweet moment because you realize you've taken them like to a place, like they don't even know where they are anymore. Yeah. You know, it's so they're, familiar. They're, they're, they're using the bathroom. Exactly with an audience <laughs> um so this is the view from inside the house looking out another yeah. awesome sight line and i don't have an image of it but what is so cool about the placement of this work is that you can see it through that window if you're looking in so it's almost like looking through a house to see the outside and then when you look outside oops this window behind me there's another image that you can see, yeah, another photograph. That's what we were talking about last week. I was like, when we went in the room and looked out the window and just seeing the sight line. And that's what I was kind of trying to say. Like, it was almost like, in my mind, I was thinking about it, like setting up a neighborhood 
So you're outside this area of the like installation, but you're confronted with this picture of a person standing outside of another house. So it almost mirrors what we're looking at in a way. Exactly. So I'll skip to here so you can see a couple of the other photographs, but the majority of the, the photographs in the, in the show are of women outside, you know, in a, in a residential setting, but then there are a couple women who are inside a home. So I, there is that feeling of domesticity that runs throughout and um, also questioning. So another outside looking in is, 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 and you talked about this in your talk with Taryn when you were talking about um, Frida. Is it Frida? Frida and Frida. Yeah, Rita and the Black Panther room uh -huh. and, and her coat. So that was like, you know, some of the first works of yours that I saw were the, an installation that, you know, we were imagining what the inside of someone's home was. And you had that juxtaposition of Rita. And you were explaining that seeing her on the street, you would never guess that this is what's inside of her home or this is what's on the inside of her big fur coat or all these Black Panther patches. And so there's another, again, that sense of, of that here, you know, uh, voyeurism in the, with some of these images where you're looking into someone's home or, or they're looking out at you. So all of these different relationships of looking in and looking out and being other, being on the inside, being on the outside, private, well, you know, domestic. Oh, there, this show gives you a little bit of everything you're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, we talked last week about the placement of the photographs and I just want to reiterate, you know, we, it was something that kind of came together, but I just felt you know, I came into the space and I felt your energy in the sense of like, okay, I know where everything's going to go. And it kind of took setting up the room and the installations within the room to figure out the placement of the photographs and, and like kind of conceptually. Uh -huh, for sure. But I just kind of was like, yeah, this goes here, this goes here. I don't and even know if we like really moved anything. No, no, it's true. They were kind of already placed. And so we walk into this gallery back here. And the first thing on the right that you see is this collage piece called Goddamn Refreshing. And a lot of the work, I mean, I've heard you say, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard you say a few times that, you know, this is a direction that you feel really strongly about moving into is the collage work and a lot of the work that you presented at Freeze. I mean, again, there were installation works and there was photography, but, um, you've been working a lot on these collage pieces. Yeah. So what I, we, I'm gonna skip forward one slide, but then come back. So in this gallery, it's called Norton Gallery. We wanted to create a sense of, well, again, there's this sort of altar. I mean, it's a little more, it's more literal this time because you have the church pews, but these mirrors, um, this piece, what you see is what you get. It's the sense of, you know, a focus towards that wall. And we wanted this room to be kind of a room of contemplation. So once you've walked through the entire space, you've trespassed in this house, or you've found things to relate to, you've been confronted with imagery that, you know, might be jarring for you or might have been kind of nostalgic. And then you find yourself in this space, sitting in these pews, looking at your own reflection, but kind of, you know, it's not, it's not direct. You don't see yourself fully. You see yourself a little bit in this mirror, a little bit in that mirror. And then in the reflection is that piece, goddamn refreshing. And if we go back, you can see, um, you know, there is a, this black and white image, this, magazine or newspaper clipping of um, black civil rights protesters being sprayed by a high power hose. And above is this image of a, of a white woman with a black blindfold. Um, so it's a really powerful and confrontational 
peace to walk into this kind of contemplative space. Um, and, you know, for me, it's, these images are really representative of kind of entitlement, but denial. You know, this woman with a black blindfold refusing to see what's right in front of her eyes. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that. The position, so you have these people getting basically brutalized by the water, the intensity of that. And then you have on the bottom corner, this woman kind of as if she just got out of the pool and she's just toweling off. And then there's this glass of, I don't know, sparkling water with a lemon in it. So it, with the title being like the title is like fighting itself as well. So it's like a reaction to like what I'm looking at those people being brutalized by the water. Um, I'm just like, God damn, like I'm frustrated. I'm angry. And then this kind of play off of the other imagery behind around it. It's like, it's refreshing. Right. But I've gone in there with um, charcoal and stained the wallpaper. So there, it feels like there's a lot going on. There aren't that many things on the collage. Then you have these kind of like Disney type birds that are made to look like they're holding up this image. Um, so it's a, and I don't even know, like, I think, you know, the word humor gets brought up and it's like, it's, it's not, I feel like humor isn't really the right word, but it's like my sarcasm, my way of like showing you how effed up everything is by almost making light of it, but at the same time, just like throwing it in your face. Right. And so creating this juxtaposition between the collage and the mirror piece I just wanted, uh, we wanted to create this moment where you couldn't escape that. You couldn't, you can't just turn your back on what's happening in that image because again, it's reflected back at you. Right. Um, and the pews, so the pews you first exhibited in New Orleans, correct? Right. So these were with the mirrors and so like, this piece is like how it was for the most part. There was one other pew that's since been sold, but um, it was really cool to bring in the hat ladies with this that were shot for, you know, those were shot in LA for a totally different project, but it was really nice to see them playing off each other really nicely. There's like an angle to the roof of this space. So it does start to have that more reference to a place of worship um so i was really excited with how this came together and that that little wall to the right was where i was like can you paint that pink just to like tie all the colors together yeah Blasting. and also that pink really draws you into the room because right. you're out from the outside yeah exactly from your from the outside looking in you're like i want to go in there <laughs> exactly and speaking of places of worship, um, we have this piece, Smell the Roses, which is if you kind of follow that guideline of moving through the space, it's the last piece that you see on your way out. Um, but I wonder if you can tell us more about this and also a bit about how you reference religion or maybe not religion, but you know, worship or cultural ideas around worship in your, in your work. Yeah, I think I, I use it as a symbol of pop culture. There's also kind of a fearfulness that I get from references of religion, like crosses and Bibles and stuff like that. Um, and I think there's this kind of like guys that folks that are super religious, it's like that they are kind of these super beings that but a lot of times that their actions aren't lining up with their beliefs and so I'm constantly kind of thinking about that and it will be sprinkled in the work um you know 
this house, this photograph was shot in New Orleans. Um, this is the house that my father grew up in. My grandfather was a bricklayer, so all the brickwork you see was done by him. It's not in the family anymore, so I didn't have access to really, um, you know, shoot very close to it. So just setting it up so I'm shooting on the, the grass and not, you know, messing with anything that um, otherwise would have been on the property, you know? Yeah. Uh, you see, like, a no trespassing sign. There's the markings, which I reference in yeah in the show at cam on the outside of the yellow house uh to kind of show that um was it fema went in there and just like checked if there were people in there or anything like that mm -hmm. and then you've got the the florida lees symbol which is also loaded and just a symbol of it has just a very new orleans vibe <laughs> Um, but I, 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 I don't know if it's, I don't know how people feel about it, but I, I know that it was once used to like brand enslaved folks. So it has a, it's a loaded symbol, I think in many ways. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, totally. And, um, I think, you know, this is maybe of all the portraits, I don't know, this is my, my feeling, but this is the most somber of um, all of the portraits that are in the exhibition. And it's sort of the last one, you know, you walk out of that, that gallery that has that, the altar, has the church pews, it has the church ladies, it has that sense of a place of worship. And then you, you know, you, this last image, you see a woman holding the Holy Bible, sort of looking down. I mean, she looks sort of reverent, but there is like that kind of somber, feeling and the clouds are a bit gray, but um, I think it lets you leave on this real contemplative note. You know, it lets you kind of, and, and one thing that was so important for me to hear from you throughout the, the making of the show was to leave room for people to have their own reading. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were times I think when I would be in my writing or maybe in our conversation sort of unpicking some unpacking, I guess I should say some of the characters. And, you know, I, I, I like that you really said, you no, know, it's important for people to read them in the way they're going to read them, you know, and that there's so many ways, so many, you know, um, symbols within each one, you know, like you said, there's the fleur de lis here. There's the, the markings of FEMA on the outside of the house. There's the- um, Drooping American flag. The American flag, a, fla a, a rose bush, right? Mm -hmm. or, a, or, you know, flowers, which appear in quite a lot of, the, of your work in general, but also in the photographs, the no trespassing sign, the Bible. And it is- Or even like a floral pattern on the gown, on like her outfit, yeah. Yeah, she's wearing a hat, which might, you know, she may have come from church. You just saw that, the lineup of all these women wearing hats. Can you tell us about those hats and the lineup? Um, I had the idea first just from like, you know, um, driving around in my neighborhood and seeing women all dolled up on, you know, Sunday mornings. And so I wanted to recreate that, but I was super fortunate to have one of my collectors <laughs> has her own kind of extensive hat collection so she did let me go through and there's like one two three four of them at least that are hers so that was cool to kind of have that connection to the hats um and then a few that I just got online maybe that's so cool yeah <laughs> they're so beautiful um and then I think oh geez <laughs> we'll come back to that Pretend you didn't see that. No. Um, I think it's funny because like this photograph was taken before this was first shown at the show for Cam, and it's one of the only images that I'm not really confronting the the viewer or the camera, right. which I think also makes it a little bit of a different photograph 
in the sense of how I usually shoot, but, and I also wanted to say that I was, I kept going to photograph, but the clouds were like, we were basically storm chasing and <laughs> it like stopped raining long enough to, you know, hop out of the car and make a couple shots. So it was cool that we got this, but you still get that sense of the clouds in me. Yeah. Like yeah. just before the rain or just after the rain or. Right. Yeah. It was just like, it was coming towards us and we're like, okay, just. Take you know, the picture. It might have <laughs> even been raining a little bit, but we Photoshopped all the raindrops out. <laughs> <laughs> As you do. As you do. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about the context of this show here uh -huh. at, in Santa Barbara. And, you know, it was a, it wasn't that long ago, but it was a really different time when we put the show up and a lot has happened. And, you know, I just, there, obviously as a, as an institution, we're just sad not to have people in our space and to be open, but it's just been so hard for me not to have this show open to people and have this space open to people right now. And, you know, because it is a space of um, allowing for contemplation and, and introspection and review and, and all of that. So, um, I mean, as we talked about last week, our journey to getting to the point where the show actually happened was over a couple of years. And so it's not that we had like, picked a very specific time, like it needs to happen now and needs to happen in this year, but um, would you be comfortable like saying why you were interested in doing a show with our institution specifically in Santa Barbara? I mean, it helps being invited, but it also, I, it, it was more from just people talking about the place. I don't know that much about Santa Barbara, but it seemed like a place that had kind of a, I don't want to say that it's not diverse, but it does have like specific, um, I think specific things that could be avoided if not confronted with, you know, like conversations that, that this particular show brings up very clearly. Right. Or, yeah. Okay, well, and, and you and I, I mean, so, you know, the demographics in Santa Barbara is, I think at the moment, maybe 42% Latinx. And so it's a, it's, it's, um, there's quite a large Latinx community here. Mm -hmm. And we have done, um, you know, quite a lot of programming, um, incorporating just you know, different areas of the community and really exploring that part of our community. And, but it is interesting because I think there are notions of Santa Barbara. First of all, the fact that it's a resort town, you know, it's right by the beach. It's about an hour and a half away from LA and it's beautiful. There's lots of greenery, but you know, it's a wedding destination. It's a part travel destination party destination so it's it's kind of layered in that sense and it's not huge it's not a huge um community um but definitely you and i talked a lot about bringing a conversation to the institution and to santa barbara that may not be taking place otherwise on this kind of scale or this kind of platform or may not have taken taken place before and um but I, but it's cool because, you know, when you were talking about the Black is Beautiful space, you, you vocalized that, you know, you want it to be a space for Black and Brown women to recognize themselves. It was important for you to also address, I think, the Latinx population that we have and, and um, just to be, you know, in, as inclusive as possible, but asking questions to everybody on all of those levels as well. Totally. And I think a lot of people did come up to me and just thank me for, you know, including you for bringing that to the community so that those things could start to be unpacked a bit. Yeah. Best, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but, you know, just to talk a bit about how 
not that the context has changed at all, but maybe the meaning of having this show right now in a place like Santa Barbara, how that may have shifted or opened up in light of, of everything that's happened, you know, in light of the pandemic, in light of uh, the murder of George Floyd and, you know, the protests that have been taking place. I mean, certainly there are, you know, when you think about the isolation that we've all been going through and staying inside of our homes for these months and the shelter, you know, the er very early shelter in place um, that was put into place by Governor Newsom, there are so many elements of this exhibition that speak to the profound experiences that we've all had in the past few months. And I just think that's, you know, again, allowing for meaning and allowing for understanding to come out of artwork and artistic practice. And I think that's so special. Yeah, I think you can definitely look at the show in the context of what's going on in the world right now. Um, one of the things that's being highlighted is always been going on and that's what my work is constantly addressing. Um, but the the level of like adding the pandemic to the story and there being a, sh a home right in the middle of the space and this idea of like not being able to go out but we're we're viewing you know some of us are getting out and going hitting the streets to protest um under the circumstances but at the same time a lot of us are watching it from our tv screens you know so the layers of just observing the world out like the world outside from within you know mm -hmm. i guess kind of just becomes another layer to it I th it's it's encouraging to me and it's like encouraging and discouraging like that this work continues to be relevant for the times like i kind of want the work to not be so relevant <laughs> you know yeah. That'll be kind of like better days. Yeah. But. but you know, what I appreciate is that you, in every kind of way of working in your photography and the installation, I mean, you know, it, it all comes together for me as one, but um, you just are providing all of these openings and opportunities for people to see themselves and to see themselves represented and to, ask themselves about, you know, their own experience. And, and I, like I said, every time I, it's not just the, these pieces where you see something new every time. Every, every time I'm looking at the photographs, I see something new. I see a new pattern. I see a new color combination. I see someone peeking out from behind the shutters. Um, so just that layered na nature and, you know, you're um, providing a space of intersectionality. Um, and so, you know, pe for people to realize that maybe they have more in common than less. And, and, you know, I think you and I have talked about the element, like our own experiences and the elements that were, that first draw me to you, drew me to your work that where I could see myself. Um, and I just, I really appreciate that. And, and that's what's so upsetting about not having people in here experiencing that and seeing it yeah. because at a time like this we want to we want to see ourselves we want to see each other we want to see our connections we want to see how we can become more connected become closer together yeah i just want to like clarify though that i want the work to not just be a space for you know black and brown folks to see themselves i want white folks to see how they they play a role in this and there's you know that collage i think points at it to be pretty clear um so it's again when i say like let the person bring their own story to it like let the open let there be openness in that sense because so many different walks of life are going to bring something new to it so i want there to be like this realization where Maybe I'm a person that I don't see myself when I walk into a space like this. So that's exciting. And then it's like, oh, I go to these spaces all the time and I'm used to seeing myself, but whoa, I'm being put on blast in a certain way. And 
I'm being asked to look back at myself and how I function every day. So exactly. there's that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, can I show this photo now? <laughs> yes. So there's that hat we talked about. Me on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> Opening night. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, let's see what, what the time is. Is it too early to open up to questions? Was there anything that you, anything else that you wanted to talk about? You said you might want to ask something. Oh. Who is that? <laughs> Just the kiddos. Not okay. mine, I don't have any kids. <laughs> yeah, so maybe we can open it up if there are questions. I will come out of this. Oh, the whole gang's here. Oh, hi. Jacqueline. <laughs> <laughs> wow, everybody. Pops is in the house. What up? <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, our loyal listener. <laughs> Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, let's definitely open it up for questions if anyone has any. This is a perfect time. Okay, Laura has does Laura have a question? Let's unmute Laura. Okay, hold on. I'm trying. There we go. Nope. I Veronica, Veronica, I'm handing it over. I have a question. Okay, Laura had a question and then Carlton has a question. Hear me now? Is this working? Yes, we hear you. Um, I've just um, had, and I, this may not even have, have been something as part of your planning, but I've just sort of noticed the cameo shape that you have and, and in terms of the, um, the collateral that we put together, the Alexandra designs this and, and going into the first room that we were looking at, the, the back mirror is in that sort of cameo shape. And I'm just wondering if this is something that you thought about and you know, because cameos have this sort of, you know, they're little mini works of art and they're carved and they're passed down in generations. It's both jewelry and maybe a, a moniker of some significant event or something like that. I was just wondering if, if that is, is purposeful. I would just throw that into the category of happy accidents. Um, just the black mirror was like, I actually made that from a found image and it's like that bubble glass. So that a lot of old photographs were often framed with. Um, and that was actually, it was purchased as a framed image and it's a, a white family, like eight fam like eight people in the family. I don't know. I just remember like it being this kind of really old school kind of, you know, the old pictures have like a little bit of a creepy vibe because everyone was like trying not to move or they would have been blurry or someone did blink and it's like, what is that? You know? Um, so I kind of like that that is looming beneath the black mirror because I put it all back in there. But anyway. Cool. I'm glad you noticed that. Everything's happening so quick when I'm making these things sometimes that um, I think things come up over and over again, like as moves or colors or shapes that might be incorporated, but I'm not always so locked into that. A good eye. <laughs> Let's see. Carlton had a Carlton. question. Very <laughs> hi hi Genevieve I just first hi. of all I just want to really appreciate you for your talent and your just your your perceptivity and your sensitivity and your humor all kind of blend in so wonderfully thank you so much for what you do and um I guess the question I have I've been con so confused because your your work has really been kind of prophetic and if you if you look what's happening now it's so is so relevant. And one of the things I've been struggling with, and, and maybe you can help me, maybe you can't with this question, but 
what can what can an old white man do um, to like own the, the the privilege from the past and to participate in change today? Do you have any ideas about that? You really show, should have showed up three weeks ago, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've kind of been talking about this. There's definitely some podcasts I can direct to you. Okay. Um, but I will start by saying that that will hopefully be the last time you allow yourself to ask that question to maybe a person of color. Only because I feel like it's a conversation. I'm kind of like a middle ground person where I can, like, I kind of, Feel like I can go in both sides not that I can go both sides but like I feel a sense of, of an obligation to help take you on that journey but at the same time I have moments where I want to stop myself um but it I think the work has to be done or those conversations have to be held with within the white community so that you can together shift kind of the patterns that have been built in to the system, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and there's so many things you can read out there. And I, I heard someone say, and this isn't because I really like you. You're, you're my, like, you know, my new, new friend, but I just, I remember listening to this podcast with, this gentleman said um it's so strange to have someone ask me what to do in this time in the time of google like what can i do what can i read you know because everything is right there mm -hmm. at your fingertips mm -hmm. so it's it's there's no easy answer you know and i hope that i mean i'm pretty much sure i'm not going to year round to see where it all kind of does totally change but depending on you know there's a lot of conversations we have had already on this platform that we that you can reference and okay. um yeah many other things so I'll share well i think that's also a good video. point genevieve just to say that there you have had so many conversations throughout your residency and all of them are available on the MCLA website, which is great because if you're just entering and you want to hear more about other shows, other perspectives, other parts of Genevieve's work, those are available. And the, and the conversation with Taryn, which was, which was great. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll get into those and look at them. Thank you. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Jeff has a question. Yeah, he does. So there's a number of the houses, eight and a half. Oh, you can put right. on the outside of the house. And, and Jeff is asking if you could talk about that as, uh, you know, the context of that. Yeah, so that, I don't know if you remember me saying that that was kind of this space that I created in honor of my niece who had passed away. So that was just like that other layer of connecting it to, my niece because that's how old she was when she passed away okay. so it's kind of loaded once you find out what it is you're like okay <laughs> but yeah that's what it's what it's for but i kind of thought it was cool that you could get an a, like a half number i guess people have half numbers for their address but yeah that's what it is all the details good eye though I wondered if anyone would notice that. Like when you're in the space, you notice it, but I didn't know if anyone would pick up on it with the pictures. Let's see, I can share it again. Um, let's see, here it is. Flash of that. Yep. Eight and a half. And also this piece, Genevieve, this, uh, we didn't, I mean, we didn't talk about all the photographs individually, but Mama Dearest, which is um, such an awesome work and so beautiful and the greenery behind you is so lush. 
But you know, one reference that I love that you mention is um, drag culture. And you know, in this image, you have used makeup to enhance your bust. But that's as a reference, you know, because obviously you don't need to enhance it. But um, I mean, I'm losing my own arm until. But I love that reference to drag culture. And, you know, I'm a big um, fan of drag queens and drag performances and RuPaul's Drag Race. And one thing that, you know, RuPaul always says is we're all in drag. You know, our personas, our, who, who we are presenting to the world every day is just a level of, of drag. Definitely. I totally agree with that. And I think I even said that maybe when we were walking through the space that I referenced drag, but I also, but it's not maybe in the extreme of, you know, drag race, but just the this, this sense that like um, often females have to kind of present themselves in this very like done up way to either get closer to the thing they need or just be taken seriously or to you know win people over and it's it's like you're constantly gauging like okay this is the next scene so like what do I have to like like can I do I have to wear a bra do I have to do this (laughs) yeah sorry that was a little awkward I'm wearing a bra, everybody. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's funny also because now we have a very different relationship to that, you know, like I put on mascara and I'm like, oh my God, it's such a thing. I'm putting on mascara today. And, you know, the... Like the, for the video today, you mean? Yes. Yeah. No, I know. I was like, I better paint the old eyebrows on. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, now we have an added layer of cultural relationship to our own drag because we've been at home. You know, there are all these memes and cartoons about being dressed from the, the top half up for all of our Zoom meetings and everything. And so oh, that kind of- started on that. <laughs> but, Sorry. you know, that that's like another, another bizarre relationship we have to the presentation of femininity and the presentation of masculinity and, and who you are and what you're wearing and the makeup and what's acceptable and- Yeah. Um, I even feel like you went with this like baby doll look to like fit into the scene there. <laughs> <laughs> totally works. Um, I went and got my nails done last week because, oh. but Governor, I know. So Governor Newsom has now closed down the nail. And believe me, I was <laughs> very careful. And the salon was very careful. But I just wanted to say that in order to get around the closing down of nail salons, because it's, you know, indoor activity and there's been a huge spike. The nail salon across the street from the museum has brought um, little nail uh, salon tables out onto the sidewalk. Whoa. That's Is that the place where I went with you? Yeah, exactly. The place that you and I went, they have like little setups on the sidewalk. Okay. And Sarah and I walked past and people were out there. Because right. you got to get your nails done. I mean, come on. Because... Set up barber people like to have their full on drag constantly. Get I your drags it. on. <laughs> I yeah. I'm you know, I'm really bummed that I couldn't come back and we couldn't because I was when you were talking about being in the space and the carpet being lush, and I was like, Yeah, we were supposed to have like youth groups come and like sit around and like, you know, have the conversations in the space and no. you had mentioned like having some sort of drag show there and all sorts of stuff. So we had so many, like, I was so excited about our programming and we're going to try now that we're kind of up and running to get some of that programming in this kind of, you know, arena. Uh, but there were going to be some really cool talks and a panel on intersectionality and arts and culture and so much that I would, I would love. So we're going to really try to make that happen. And so everybody keep your eyes peeled. Um, I know it's such a bummer. Just come back and live in this space. We'll just, we'll just create a little family. We'll live in this space. <laughs> I just want to say that there's a stack of toilet paper. I'm, over there. Exactly. I'm not going to live there. There was literally a moment when Sarah and I thought 
because there was no toilet paper in all of Santa Barbara County, we were like, would Genevieve mind if we <laughs> her, <laughs> her stash? Like, she, maybe she won't know. No, remember there was one roll of toilet paper for some reason that was wrapped individually, like in yeah, plastic and, and tissue. Oh, yeah. So well, every every roll but that one could have been. Okay. <laughs> It's a free for all. <laughs> also, if I run out of lotion, I'm just gonna use that cocoa butter. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go shopping there. I have a question for for Alex and Genevieve, just in terms of like you've shared so many really amazing stories and you know, like moments and it we I think we've definitely had a chance to see how it all evolved and how the relationship that you established really helped to make the show, I think for both of you, obviously like beyond your expectations. And I'm wondering, you know, in the midst of this, you talk when you, were there ever any moments that because of the, the content of the show and some of the things that, you know, maybe some of the decision-making that had to go on between the two of you, although it seemed like it was clear. Were there any moments like you really felt like, oh, wow, like I learned something from this person or, oh, I didn't, you know what I mean? Or like, because I think that we missed that, that you, I mean, I, and Amphetti knows you spend a lot of time together. I personally feel like I spend way too much time with Genevieve, but beyond that, you know, that you just like, you, but do you ever have those moments where you're like, hmm, yeah, you know, make it even, I don't know, fairly intimate or like, really amazing, I guess is what I'm saying, but were there ever any of those for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, Genevieve really pushed me. She really pushed me in this. No one was harmed. <laughs> no one was harmed in the making of this exhibition, <laughs> only emotionally. Um, no, 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 Gen from the beginning, you know what? I remember, I don't remember exactly what you said, but even during our studio visit, I remember you brought up um, one of the subjects in your photograph, like one of the contexts in one of the photographs we were looking at, um, you brought up no some notion of white supremacy. And I really didn't know you then. And I, you know, didn't want to react, but it was, it was such an um, important moment for me to really understand white supremacy on a deeper level and understand like our, the current state of, of, of white supremacy and, and see that more clearly. And that was like the beginning of me really feeling challenged in a super positive way by the work. So Genevieve and I got along really well from the beginning. We relate on a lot of levels. You know, we are like basically the same age. So when in the space, we we're listening to like music that I think we both listened to in high school. So like on that level, there was so much for us to relate to. But um, yeah, I, I felt really kind of, I, I feel like I grew a lot through this show. And I would say just seeing Alex kind of basically running the show there. Obviously, there's a lot of people helping and create this thing, but at the end of the day, I feel like everyone kind of looks to you to like make sure that it's every box has been checked off, you know? And just being able to see someone be able to kind of keep your head on your shoulders kind of and not I mean maybe you were screaming in the back room and I didn't see you. was she screaming in the back room Sarah <laughs> hilarious there were some cigarette breaks <laughs> <laughs> these ladies have their 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 stressors their stress relievers um that I don't partake in but I have my own I'm sure <laughs> oh, <fingertips>. um, <laughs> no during install you got to find your outlets <laughs> Preferably healthier outlets, but yeah. True. True. But I, I do like I gain a lot of respect for curators that really are in the driver's seat. They have to know when to look like they're not like when they're trusting their artists. <laughs> and you know, maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but um feeling like the person can still be their creative self while you're kind of like 
cradling them a little bit, just making sure that they can pull it off. So that always like blows my mind. <laughs> Don't want that job, but love you guys for having it. <laughs> we sure like a true artist. We have a question from Maria. Hey, no. Oh wait, wait. I mean, okay, there we go. Is it unmuted? Veronica, I'm not going to touch anything. There we go. <laughs> All right. Genevieve, I have a question for you. Um, I'm curious about your upcoming projects and um, what you're working on right now. And, I, and I, do you find yourself needing to um, uh, approach projects to educate um, the white community? Um, I know your your work is a little bit more. Seeing the show, it's it's not necessarily about that. It, there's there's that one piece with the the collage piece was really powerful that way. But um, I'm just curious if, if, if you feel like you need to um, educate the white community more about um, our, the history of white supremacy. And, um, and by the way, Carlton, um, I just read a book called um, White Fragility. And it's, um, I recommend it. Just, uh, it's written by, um, I forget her name, but um, the title is White Fragility. I think I, I recommend you read it. Anyway, what do you think, Genevieve? So I don't think I'm like thinking of it as like an educational tool for for white folks. I think I'm just as as I have like developed and become more comfortable with the materials I use and just kind of like how like I don't know if it's just like finger figuring out my language through the materials that I use, I am able to kind of put forth just the reality of things in a different, in a different form. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully it just, it's, it's like that particular collage I was, that we were talking about earlier. It's like, it draws you in for certain reasons, but then you're just like trapped with like the bigger meaning once you get in there. So it's gonna do that thing, but it's gonna do that for everyone, mm -hmm. you know? True. Um, so I think I'm just gonna continue to just be as bold and um, just front and center with it mm -hmm. because I think that's, what gets to I get that gets through to people faster you know mm -hmm. um, and I'm definitely open to the work being used as a tool for that but it's not what I'm thinking about necessarily mm -hmm. I'm kind of having reactions to imagery that I find in these vintage magazines mm -hmm. in the context of what's going on today mm -hmm. which was also going on back then Sure. Yeah, it's that that history. It's not new. It's nothing new. We 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 just um, a lot of us are wanting to learn more about it and wanting more change. So um, I just think that there's a sense of urgency, and I just was curious if you wanted to be bolder with your with your work. Yeah, for sure. And I think you know I'm doing a show for um, the residency that I'm in right now, so that is just going to be a pretty, I think, in your face kind of, you know, collages that are similar to some of the things we talked about today. Um, that sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so well, you, thanks. Use Thank them you. as a tool for, you know, Perfect. broadening your, your perspective. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Well, we are nearing that last minute. If there are any other questions, definitely share them now. Um, I, I just personally want to take an opportunity to uh, thank all of you that have joined us these past couple of weeks. Um, but also, I, I want to thank all of you that have joined us even before now that brought us here. If Alex and Sarah hadn't joined us at one point, we never would have come up with this conversation. So we so appreciate you um, participating in the discussion. I think that's one thing 
that Genevieve and I have been so pleased and excited about, and I think is what we hoped most. And we're really excited about the community that we've, that we've created through these discussions, but that I feel, um, you know, to Carlton's question and also to Maria, when we talk about all of the roles that we have to play that Genevieve uh, referenced, they are all very different. But I think what we most need to keep in mind is that this is how we sustain this movement. I know there is a certain sense of urgency, but because this has always happened, it will continue to happen, but it depends on the work that we all do, like what we're doing right now. And it's staying, you know, um, I think that's what we are hoping that everyone does, that it's work like Genevieve is creating that Alex shows in all of these institutions where we create an opportunity for people to come together and talk is what is going to keep the momentum and hopefully bring that change that we're all that we're all seeking. So I want to thank all of you for participating in that. I especially want to thank obviously Genevieve and Alex and Sarah and Veronica for helping us to all make this happen. Um, and you know I think what I, again, am most pleased about is everybody's willingness to participate and, um, and do the work. So hopefully we'll continue and resume the conversation next week um, and the week after that. Genevieve is here with us through August and it's going by really quickly. So I, I don't like to talk about that a lot because I get a little sad. But um, aside from that, we have lots of other conversations that we're going to have and I hope that you will join us again. Although. Genevieve is, we're gonna take a break next Wednesday and then we will be back the Wednesday after that. Um, but I do wanna plug a conversation that we're gonna have within our arts community here in the Berkshires um, about behavior that brings us individually towards anti-racism as individuals who are members of arts organization and the art community and what that means. So if anybody wants to join us for that conversation, that'll be on July 23rd. But if not, we hope to see you again very soon. We hope that everybody still stays well and safe. And um, thank you. Thank you, all of you. So, thank you so much. Thank you, Erica. Thank you for your questions. Bye, Jack. Bye. 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 Bye.